Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, if you take your seats and start getting concentrated, we can start with our CS lecture. I want to welcome you all before I start to this first CS lecture on the epic of Gilgamesh. I probably heard about Gilgamesh. Today you will know much more about this Mesopotamian king. So, as you may know, before we start, let me just tell you that, as you may know, AUB and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences are celebrating this year their 150th anniversary. And AUB is proud to repeat, to say that it is a liberal arts institution of higher learning. You may wonder what a liberal arts education is or what a liberal arts university is. Well, this means very simply that at the undergraduate level, AUB does not intend to form professionals, but rather people who can think critically and rationally for themselves, people who are broad-minded, people who are aware how man's view of the universe, of the gods, and of himself have evolved across the centuries to shape what we are today, people who can be challenged in their beliefs and in their opinions, and who can engage in a rational dialogue with their fellow men. At the heart of this liberal education is the Civilization Studies program. You may ask, how is CS at the heart of a liberal education? Well, let me explain this to you, and let me brief, briefly tell you what CS is about so that you understand why this program is really at the heart of a liberal education. CS courses stand at the crossroad of different disciplines, such as literature, philosophy, history, social sciences, natural sciences, and others. However, in CS, as you will notice, you know, across the year, we do not look at these texts from the point of view of the specialist. What we want to explore in these texts is man, his role, his ideas, his beliefs, his values in each specific cultural framework or context. CS courses consist exclusively of texts representative of Eastern and Western culture that were shaped on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea from early antiquity or early history to modern times. While reading the texts, we shall try we shall try to understand the point of view of the text itself. The best approach to do this is to explore the basic notions and concepts found in the text, like for example, the concept of happiness. What is happiness? What is friendship? What is evil? What is good? What is love? What is death? And so on and so forth. But these notions and concepts are often not bluntly or directly expressed in the text. There is no explicit definition of what is good and what is bad. They are hinted at in an indirect way, by symbols. So if we want to understand the message of these texts properly, we have to read the symbols to analyze and to interpret them. This is the main purpose of the CS lecture. The lecture intends to help you understand the text by pointing out to you the main issues that you can further discuss and analyze in class. But of course, if you want to have interesting discussion sessions in the classroom and express an opinion, you have to have read the assigned text. So please, read the text and then go to class. Now, what is the appropriate way to analyze the text that you are reading? How you should approach it? How you should uh, you know, deal with the text? Well, since the CS approach is mainly concerned with man, the most useful way is to analyze the three basic relationships of man in the world. The first relation is that of man with himself. How does man come to terms with his human condition? How does man answer the question, who am I? What am I doing here? What happens to me if I die? And so on and so forth. So the first approach is to look at man 
at his relations with himself. The second basic relationship of man is with his fellow man. We all live in society, nobody lives in his ivory tower, so we have to deal with other people. And we have to know how man tries to come to terms with other human beings. This is what we call the social or communal level of the analysis, uh, how to deal with my fellow man. And the third relationship of man is with the universe, with the cosmos, with nature. And supernatural forces or powers such as gods, fate, chance, and so on and so forth that affect his life and over which he has no control. This is the cosmological level of the analysis. So the CS program studies human culture in its various expressions. It broadens our understanding of man, of our own, as well as of other cultures. Our culture alone makes no sense. We have to place it in its larger Near Eastern and Mediterranean context in order to understand what we are. It is therefore, this is why we call CS, that it is at the heart of a liberal education. This is what liberal education is about. So now let's turn to our epic. The epic of Gilgamesh. First of all, what is an epic? If we speak of an epic, we have to give a definition. And the definition is the following. An epic is a poem involving heroes, meaning men endowed with superhuman powers and gods. So heroes and gods. You have your own heroes today, Superman, uh, Batman, and I don't know who. And in antiquity, they had a hero called Gilgamesh. The epics have a twofold purpose. First, to entertain the reader or the audience. Uh, to have a nice time, to spend uh, 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 an interesting time. And second, and this is the most important part that we will be dealing with in this lecture, is to give a message. A message about the values, the philosophical, the social, and the moral standards of a given society at a given time. In the epic, the hero or heroes, if there are many, represent all these values. They symbolize all these values. They embody them. They become the symbols and the representatives of their so society and their time. So in CS201, the Epic of Gilgamesh is not the only epic you read. You will read two other epics, the Odyssey and the Aeneid of Virgil and you will have plenty of room to discuss, compare, and contrast these epics together and the values they represent. The Epic of Gilgamesh, however, is the oldest epic known to us in world literature. So you are very lucky to look at the first epic production of mankind. It is, as one great scholar puts it, the most significant literary creation of the whole of ancient Mesopotamia. Over the years, the story did not die out, is not, has not become obsolete. On the contrary, over the years, the story has been variously reworked into plays, novels, or, and at least two operas. In 2013, a group of young dancers called Antiques Dancers created a hip-hop dance interpretation of the Epic of Gilgamesh. I gave you the link so you can look at it when you go home. Finally, this year, and in celebration of the centenary of the School of Oriental and African Studies, you know, one of the most prestigious schools in England, the acclaimed performance storyteller, Hagati, came to SOAS to give his rendering of the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh with musical accompaniment by SOAS alumnus Jonah Brody. So you see, even today, the epic of Gilgamesh is at the center of cultural life, is at the center of intellectual life. But since the epic of Gilgamesh is the only sample of Mesopotamian literature that we read in CS, and since most of you, I presume, are not familiar with Mesopotamian civilization, let us dwell for a few minutes 
on the homeland of Gilgamesh so that you can understand a little bit better where our story is taking place and what was the kind of country that Gilgamesh came from. Mesopotamia, you have the map here, is the name given by the Greeks to what is today modern Iraq and northeast Syria. It means, in Greek, the land between the rivers. In Arabic, you all know the term, Bilad ma bain al-Nahrain, or Bilad al-Rafidain. The two Rafidain are the Tigris and the Euphrates. Dijla wal Furat. So the geographical setting of our epic is the Mesopotamian south, the south of this map that you are looking at which was called by its ancient dwellers the land of Sumer and Akkad. In Sumer, on the Euphrates, lies the city of Uruk, modern al warqa which is one of the oldest cities of the ancient Near East. The hero of our epic, Gilgamesh, was a Sumerian king of Uruk. The Sumerians were the earliest settlers or inhabitants of Mesopotamia. Their language cannot be compared with any other language or it cannot be affiliated to any other language known to us. The Sumerians were the first inventors of writing. They invented the so-called cuneiform writing, what we call in Arabic al-Khat al-Masmari, and they wrote on clay tablets and they were predominantly urban people. They lived in cities, big, important cities, and they lived, uh, their land was divided into small kingdoms. Together with the Sumerians lived another population group called Akkadians, after the name of their city, Akkad. These people differed from the Sumerians in that they spoke a language which belongs to the same linguistic family as Arabic and Hebrew. This family, langu family of languages is called Semitic. So they spoke a Semitic language. The Akkadians obviously came from a different cultural background than the Sumerians. But the peaceful cultural interaction between Sumerians and Akkadians lasted for more than a thousand years, or almost a thousand years. Akkadian room became predominant in Mesopotamia around 2000 BC, and the Akkadian language progressively replaced Sumerian as both the spoken and the official language. So back to our epic now. Gilgamesh is now believed to have been a real historical king of Uruk, not a legendary king, not you know, the fruit of the imagination of a, of a creative writer, no. He is a Sumerian king who ruled some 4,500 years ago in uh, Sumer, in the city of Uruk, and who became, after his death, like many other great kings of antiquity, the hero of many tales. Just think of Alexander the Great, just think of Moses, just think of all these important men who became the heroes of many legends. In these tales, because of his, you know, extraordinary deeds, he was given semi-divine and superhuman features. So the tales about Gilgamesh were first transmitted orally. People told each other, you know, about the great deeds of Gilgamesh for many, many years, even centuries. This tradition was an oral tradition. Only much later, several of these tales were fixed in writing in the Sumerian language. They started writing down the stories about Gilgamesh. Five of them came down to us. These tales were originally not connected to each other. They are five different stories about Gilgamesh, but they do not form a coherent story, a coherent epic. It is only in the final phase of the epic's evolution, almost a millennium after the hero's death, that these tales were joined together into a literary composition with a unified theme and a meaningful plot so a real story. This final integrated and coherent version of the epic is written in Akkadian, not in Sumerian anymore, but in Akkadian, in the Semitic language that had become now the language of Mesopotamia. 
in this final text that you are going to read and that you are going to discuss in this lecture. The most complete version of the text, because you know this text was so famous, so uh, popular, that it was sent to all over the, the Near East, and each country had its own epic of Gilgamesh, that is, the, the scribes wrote down the same story several times. But uh, the most complete version that we have is written on 12 clay tablets that were found, you know, discovered for the first time in the library of the Assyrian king Ashur Banipal. This Assyrian king ruled between 669 and 627 BC in Nineveh, Ninawa. You've heard in the news a lot about Ninawa these days in northern Iraq. The text of the standard version is partly destroyed and some passages remain obscure, but since the story was so popular and spread all over the ancient Near East, they, the scholars took the other versions of the same story to fill in the gaps and give us a better understanding of the text. So this is this final Akkadian version of the epic that appears to have been more interested in the message its author saw in Gilgamesh's life rather than in Gilgamesh himself as a historical king and a great man. This message is concerned with people's attitude towards death. This is the first time in written literature, in world liter literature, that we see the attempt of answering what is death? How do I have to react against death? What waits for me after I die? And so on and so forth. So, the story begins by introducing the hero to us, wild bull of Lugal Banda. Lugal Banda is his father. Gilgamesh, the perfect in strength, suckling of the august wild cow, the goddess Ninsun. Gilgamesh was his name from the day he was born, two thirds of him God and one third man. So he is half human, half divine. From his mother, the goddess Ninsun, he inherited beauty and restlessness. From his human father, Lugalbanda, he inherited what we all inherit when we are born, mortality. In the epic, Gilgamesh is characterized by tremendous vigor and energy. He's a strong, restless boy, you know, and he harasses the young man of Uruk and the young girls of Uruk, and he takes them away from their families. The text says, no son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, even the children, yet, the king should be a shepherd to his people, not a tyrant, not a despot, but a shepherd to his people. His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. So the people of Uruk were not happy with this oppressive situation. They complained to the gods, and the gods perceived with remarkable insight that it was Gilgamesh's superior energy and strength which set him apart and made him feel lonely. Nobody could cope with him. Nobody could follow him. Nobody had the same strength to play with him. So they discovered that he needed a friend and someone who measures up to him. So the gods created a Gilgamesh beast, a counterpart to Gilgamesh, a man called Enkidu. So, the text says, the gods cried to Aruru. Aruru is the mother goddess, you know, the goddess who gives birth to humans, the goddess of creation. You made him, O Aruru, now create his equal. Let it be as his own reflection, his second self, stormy heart for stormy heart. So the, the exact counterpart of Gilgamesh was born. And Enkidu, instead of being born like Gilgamesh in the city, was born in the steppe. What is the steppe? The steppe is a desert, a place where only wild animals live. No humans live in the steppe. So it is the wild area around the city of Uruk. He represents man in the state of nature, Mowgli. Huh? You all know Jungle Book, and you all know Mowgli. He grew up in 
and in the state of nature with the wild animals. He lives with and like the wild animals of the steppe. On one day, a trapper sees him destroying the traps set to catch the wild animals. He makes his way to Uruk. He runs to Gilgamesh and tells him, please save us from this man who is like an animal. And he asks for a woman from the city, a harlot, says the text, to go with him to seduce Enkidu. His request is granted, and for a whole week, Enkidu enjoys himself with Shamchat, the harlot. But when he wants to go back to his animal life after a week, the animals, his animal companions, shy away from him. He lost his old, power, his old power and his speed. He cannot run with them anymore. So Enkidu leaves the step with the harlot. He meets the shepherds and finally goes to the city of Uruk. There he meets Gilgamesh and fights with him. And as the popular Arabic say, says, Ma'ila kirfi illa ba'd atli, they fight together, and out of their battle grows a lasting friendship. Gilgamesh and Enkidu achieve together great deeds. They go to the cedar mountain and kill the monster Khumbaba. Here he is, our friend Khumbaba. And here you have Gilgamesh and Enkidu slaying Khumbaba. Upon their return, the goddess Ishtar, the goddess of love and war, falls in love with Gilgamesh and asks him to marry her. Gilgamesh insolently refuses her offer and reminds her of, her of the fate of all her former lovers that she killed, by the way. Upset by this refusal, by this insolent refusal, Ishtar goes to her father, Anu, the god of heavens, and asks him to give her the bull of heaven. This bull of heaven, who is another monster, in order to destroy Gilgamesh. The two friends fight against the bull of heaven, and insult the god, and finally they kill him. And because they are so drunk with success, they forget that they are humans, and that the gods are very powerful, and they forget that the gods can take revenge. They forgot the retribution of the gods. Enlil, the god of the air, decreed by, you know, by decree, decided by decree the fate of Enkidu, and he said he has to die because he's the one who gave the final blow to the bull of heavens. So Enkidu's death is the central theme or central event in the epic. Why? Because it is the event that brings the focus upon the main theme of the epic, Gilgamesh's quest for immortality. After the loss of his friend, Gilgamesh becomes obsessed by death, and he tries to win real immortality. He doesn't want to die. He wants to become immortal like a god. In his quest for ever everlasting life, he goes to meet Utnapishtim, the Mesopotamian counterpart of biblical Nuh, Noah, the only person who survived the flood, the Tufan, and the only man who was granted immortality by the gods. So on his way to him, Gilgamesh meets Siduri, a winemaker who sees the hopelessness of his quest, and she tries to dissuade him. Gilgamesh goes on, and after many hardships, finds Utnapishtim. And Utnapishtim gives him two chances to become immortal, and he misses both of them. And after his failure, Gilgamesh goes back to Uruk, convinced that the only immortality man can seek is in achievement. So the event I just described to you are the entertaining part of the epic. They are the extraordinary adventures, the suspense accompanying Gilgamesh's quest for immortality. They are the entertainment, you know, of the epic. But entertainment was not the only purpose. The epic conveyed a message, and the message is the following. It explored some basic notions, such as, what is it to be a man? How should we come to terms with our human condition, with our fate, with the fact that eventually we will die someday? What is the meaning of life if you have to die? Why is life worth living? Why don't you all go and commit suicide since you are going to, to die? How should we live 
how we should we live life knowing that death is inescapable? The epic does not only ask these questions and others, but it also tries to give some answers. Let's see now what is the message of the epic. Let's first try and see how the epic views man. What is it to be a man in the eyes of the Mesopotamian writer and for the Mesopotamians? Otherwise said, uh, what was it for the Mesopotamian to be a man? This question is partly answered by the early life and transformation of Enkidu. As you have already pointed out, Enkidu is pictured as living with and like wild animals, ignorant of man's ways, ignorant of civilization. Before he could become civilized, he needed to be humanized. He needed to become a human. So it is in the state of nature that he was an animal-like being. He was not a man in the eyes of the Mesopotamian author. The process of his humanization is very clearly described. It starts when he meets the harlot, the woman, another human being, though this is when he becomes a human himself, when he has to deal with another human, with the harlot. What happens when he meets her and spends with her a whole week? The text says his body was bound as though with a cord. His knees gave way when he started to run. His swiftness was gone. Enkidu was grown weak, for wisdom was in him. And the thoughts of a man were in his heart. End of quote. So this means that his contact with the woman broadened his understanding, awakened his intelligence. What he acquired from intercourse with the harlot was the intellectual potential, the intellectual power or capacity to adopt human ways and to desire human companionship. So it is contact, through contact with another human being that he is humanized. Now that his intelligence is awakened through this contact, he can become a man. That is, a human being desiring to live with other human beings in a civilized world. His animal-like aspect has disappeared. And the harlot tells him, you are wise, Enkidu, and now you have become like a god. So for the Mesopotamians, Man is neither animal nor God. He is godlike, meaning endowed with intelligence, with knowledge, and capable of civilization. So when Enkidu meets the shepherds, he is capable to imitate them. He is capable to learn their ways. And it is only then that the process of his humanization is accomplished. Your text says, then the woman said, Enkidu, eat bread. It is the stuff of life. Drink wine. It is the custom of the land. So he ate till he was full and drank strong wine, seven goblets. He became merry, his heart exalted, and his face shone. He rubbed down the matted hair of his body and anointed himself with oil. Enkidu had become a man. So something magical and decisive had happened. Enkidu has made his choice. From then on, he belonged to the human race, not to the animal race anymore. So to be a man in the eyes of the Mesopotamians, start by desiring human companionship and by knowing and adopting civilization. But this is only part of the answer to the question of what man is. The epic goes further and deeper in its exploration of man's identity, and the answer is given at the very end of the epic by Gilgamesh himself. What Gilgamesh, the great hero and king of Uruk, has learned from his failure in the quest of immortality is very simply the awareness that he, the i.e. man, is mortal. The awareness that death is man's lot, man's share, man's sad condition. And this is formulated in the epic for the first time in human history. So to be a man is first and foremost to be finite, to be mortal. Man is neither an animal like Enkidu, nor a god like the gods, nor eternal like the gods. But man, 
is like Gilgamesh, an intelligent, civilized person, capable of great achievements, desirous of gaining knowledge, but whose destiny is ultimately to die. So this leads us to another question posed by the Epic of Gilgamesh. How does man react to this inescapable fate, to the fact that he has to die? So man's attitude towards death is the major theme of the epic, and the various attitudes or reactions that humans tend to adopt are exemplified in the epic by a single figure, the hero Gilgamesh. In the beginning, the young and restless king of Uruk had only one concern, to achieve great deeds, to become famous, deeds that no person, no one before him had accomplished, and thus leave an enduring name. So uh, this is what he tells Enkidu, who is reluctant and afraid to go to kill Humbaba, the monster in the cedar forest. And he tells, Humbaba, he tells uh, Enkidu, then if I fall in this fight against Humbaba, I leave behind me a name that endures. Men will say of me, Gilgamesh has fallen in fight with ferocious Humbaba. Gilgamesh knew that he had eventually to die, and he tells Enkidu, only the gods live forever with glorious Shamash. But as for us, men, our days are numbered. This means that death was known to Gilgamesh. It's not a discovery when Enkidu dies, but he knew about death, but for him, since he had to die anyway, he wanted, to, he wanted it to be a glorious death, in battle with a worthy foe, with a worthy enemy, so that his name and fame would endure. So his first attitude towards death was to seek immortality through fame. His youth, his success, his extraordinary deeds made him feel godlike, invincible, invulnerable, to the point that he dared defy the, greatest, the great goddess Ishtar. At the climax of his success, he became arrogant, irrespectful of the gods, and forgetful of the fact that he was but a mortal. But when Enkidu, his only friend and very dear friend, dies, everything collapses around him. With the death of Enkidu, death strikes him in its stark reality. Gilgamesh refuses with all his soul to accept death as real. The loss he has suffered is unbearable to him. He stands puzzled before death, before the lifeless corpse of his friend of Enkidu. This fear of death becomes an obsession with Gilgamesh. The thought that he, the great Gil Gilgamesh, he himself must die, haunted him day and night and left him no peace. So with the awareness that eventually he himself would die, all his previous values collapsed. Enduring name, immortal fame, all of this suddenly meant nothing to him anymore. Only real, physical immortality, an impossible goal was the only thing Gilgamesh now wanted. He had heard about an ancestor of his, a man called Utnapishtim, who had gained eternal life. So he went to him, he wanted to see what he did to gain immortal life. The story of the flood that you will read in the 12th tablet, told to him by Utnapishtim, shows that the case of Utnapishtim was unique and could never happen again. Utnapishtim is aware of that, but he wants to prove to Gilgamesh the futility and the impossibility of his quest. He challenges him to resist sleep for a week. He told him, if you, if you stay awake for a whole week, then you will become immortal. Of course, who can stay awake for a whole week? Gilgamesh slept. But understandably, Gilgamesh fades. His failure proves how utterly impossible is his hope for energy strong enough to overcome death. When the snake snatches the plant of rejuvenation, this is the second chance he has to become immortal. So the snake snatches the plant of rejuvenation away from him, the plant that can make him young again, the he, he loses his last hope for immortality. The second failure too was due to his basic human nature, his basic human weakness, a moment of carelessness. 
In other words, his quest for actual immortality defied and challenged human nature itself. It was an impossible quest. For the first time, as he fails twice in his undertaking, Gilgamesh is completely deprived of any heroic stature or dimension. Only then does he come back to his senses. Only then does he, he see himself as pitiful and he starts crying. This is what I am at the end, a poor mortal uh, person or being. The panic, the fear of death leaves him. And this brings his quest for immortality to an end. It has, be, it has come to nothing. He has to admit final and utter defeat. He is mortal and will stay mortal. So the mood in which he meets this final defeat is new and different from what he has been capable of before. It is a mood of resignation, an awareness of the irony of his fate, not one of terror and despair. He has found the peace he was looking for by having the courage to face and to accept reality, the fact that he is immortal. The outcome of Gilgamesh's quest is the understanding of his human condition. He has acquired wisdom. And this aspect is praised in the epic much more than the heroic deeds and the quest for immortality. So the epic of Gilgamesh ends by presenting a third attitude towards death. Man has to die, but what he achieves during his lifetime survives him. In other words, Gilgamesh, who knows that the only immortality he can seek is in achievement, he builds the walls of Uruk, magnificent walls that stand today and that you can go and visit one day if you go to southern Iraq, they survive and they are the witness for the greatest achievements of King Gilgamesh. So while exploring man's attitude towards death, the author of the epic makes a statement about how one ought to live one's life knowing that death is inescapable. So if I, I have to die, how should I live? This message is conveyed by another person of the, the epic, a woman called Siduri. She is a tavern keeper, a winemaker, whom Gilgamesh meets on his way to Utnapishtim. The tavern keeper uh, uh, dissuades him, or tries at least to dissuade him, by showing him the futility and the impossibility of his quest, since only gods are mortal. She tells him, Gilgamesh, where are you hurrying to? You will never find that life for which you are looking. When God created man, they allotted to him death. But life, they, retur they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things, day and night, night and day. Dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. Let your clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water, cherish the little side that holds your hand, and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this, too, is the lot of man. So the advice, uh, what Siduri is offering Gilgamesh is a conventional philosophy of life. This advice of hers is formulated in a way that seems addressed to the epic's audience as well, not only to Gilgamesh. The simple pleasures advocated by Siduri are something uh, many could strive for, you, me, we can all do what she's telling Gilgamesh to do, unlike the heroic deeds, which were only for the few. The sun god Shamash, here he is, seated with the rays of light coming out of his shoulders. He is the god of justice, and he addresses Enkidu more or less in the same way as Siduri addresses Gilgamesh. On his deathbed, Enkidu curses the harlot for having brought him to civilization. She should have left him with the wild animals. The sun god's response to Enkidu implies that the life to which the harlot brought him was worth living, despite the untimely death it entailed. The sun god tells Enkidu, why are you cursing the woman? the mistress who taught you to eat bread fit for gods and drink wine of kings. 
She who put on you a magnificent garment, she dressed you, you were naked, she dressed you. Did she not give you glorious Gilgamesh for your companion? You learned what friendship is when you met Gilgamesh. And has not Gilgamesh, your own brother, made you rest on a royal bed and recline on a couch at his left hand? So from these lines, we understand that the epic underlines the satisfaction that civilized life offers. In other words, that minimum amount of meaning that man's life has. This is the epic's message too. These simple pleasures in the eyes of the Mesopotamians were sufficient to make life worth living and enjoyable despite the dreadful perspective of death. Man should not lose his time and energy trying to get some impossible things. He should be satisfied with simple pleasures civilized life can offer him. These passages that we just mentioned were often described as hedonistic, and hedonism means to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Don't think of what you know makes you unhappy. Just do the things that gives you some pleasure. This is what hedonism is about. So the Epic of Gilgamesh shows us how man understood and explained his relations with the supernatural powers, these gods who affected his life and destiny. As we can gather from our text, the Mesopotamians believed in a great number of gods and monsters, some of whom you meet in the Epic, like Anu, the god of heavens, Enlil, the god of the air, Enki or Ea, the god of wisdom and of the sweet waters, you can see them all here represented on cylinder seeds or on small terracottas. They represented them as, you know, they imagined them anthropomorphically like humans. And they were believed to look and act like humans, to hate, to love, to take revenge, and so on and so forth. So, uh, Ishtar, the goddess of love of war, the sun god Shamash, Humbaba, and the bull of heavens. You have them all here on the slide. You can look at them. All these gods were believed to look and act like humans, but they were more powerful. And first and foremost, they were immortal. They do not die. They interfered in man's life, either by helping or by punishing him, or often by dictating their will, man was not free to do whatever he pleased. He had to obey the orders of the gods. Moreover, their behavior and their reactions were unpredictable. Man didn't know what the gods wanted from him, how they are going to react at his actions, and so on. So their decisions and decrees were often arbitrary and unfair. Thus, the general atmosphere that you can gather from the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of insecurity, of instability, of some sort of pessimism. From the story of the flood, we learn that man was created by the gods to be their servant, their slave. This is a slave-master relationship. Gods are the master, man is their slave, he is there to serve them, to feed them. There is no confidence, no real reliability, no peace, no clear rule between man and the gods. There is no agreement between the two. This is why we say that the will of the gods is unpredictable. Like all ancient people, Sumerians and Akkadians could not conceive that death was really the end, that after death, you know, you become atoms that disappear in the air. They believed in a life after death. And this life after death takes place in a place that they call the netherworld, and there their spirit that they called etemu, or their ghost, if you want, or their soul, as you call it today, survives. Enkidu, when he was about to die, has a vision of this place where all the dead people go. And let's look at the description of this, uh, of this place. There is a house whose people sit in darkness. Dust is their food and clay their meat. So they are not enjoying the pleasures of eating good things, drinking you know, clear water and wine. They are clothed like birds, like the picture you see here. She's the goddess of the underworld and she's clothed with feathers like birds. They are naked 
and the only garment they can wear are feathers. They are clothed like birds with wings for covering. They see no light and they sit in darkness. So this gloomy and depressive view of what waits, awaits us after death of the netherworld, of the underworld, as you want to call it. The Sumerians called it house of darkness, house of dust, land of no return. Nobody ever came back from this land. The view of life after death described by Enkidu deprives man from hope in something better than his earthly life and adds to his pessimism and despair. Mesopotamian man dreaded death because he viewed the underworld as a place where all earthly pleasures are absent. It is a place, if you don't take these pleasures during your lifetime, don't hope for anything better in the afterlife. And this, believe me, is a pessimistic view of man. So confronted with such a dreadful perspective, what a poor consolation were Siduri's word to Gilgamesh and how understandable was Gilgamesh's rebellion against his fate. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you very much.